Uh, okay, so you must all wonder who is Simrise. We're actually a business to business type of company. So we're a flavor supplier. That means we're always in between. So for us, even if we're a flavor supplier, it's still very important to understand the consumers of our customers. Mm -hmm. So today what I wanted to share with you is how we have used uh, ethnographic studies to actually go and investigate insights on what we call challenging consumers. So this is uh, the different steps that I'm going to go through during my presentation. And the first uh, step that I wanted to do is to explain you how we use insights in the flavor development process at Simrise. So this is our strategy. We actually sell flavors, okay? So flavors, fragrances. Uh, and what is important for us is we actually go into the mind of our customers, consumers. Because at the end of the day, all the flavor houses can provide our customers with a flavor. However, not every consumer is ready to, to accept a specific flavor for a specific brand. So somehow, for every project we do, we actually have to understand the consumers. And of course, we're going to use very different techniques depending on the stage of development we're at. So as you can see here, we usually have three different stages uh, in the development process. And in purple, you have my group, where the sensory and consumer insights group. Then we, we work very closely in collaboration with the marketers. And in yellow, you actually see the specialists, all the technical team who actually put flavors together. So a lot of our customers are very surprised when I show this approach because they tend to call us at the yellow part, give us a flavor. They're not aware of all the work we have done prior to that to actually validate and get different insights from different products. So uh, the ethnography studies, as I mean, I have all the specialists in the room, is actually coming on the first step where we try to understand the lifestyle of consumers, especially being a flavor house, we try to understand a lot on how they cook as well. And as you know, when people cook, if you put them in a room with a questionnaire, they're going to tell you half of the story. So we actually observe a lot of people cooking. So why do we call these uh, consumers challenging? Some of these consumers, they're actually not able to talk yet, okay? such as infant. So we need to go and observe them in their natural environment. Others feel more comfortable at home or in their natural environment, such as the seniors and the kids, low-income consumers as well. Others, as I just mentioned to you, are actually uh, are doing an activity we're interested in, such as cooking, that means we go and need to use ethnography to actually study what is interesting to us. That means what type of flavors do they put together at home. So today I'm going to showcase to you two different studies, one where we have used ethnography for kids in China, and another one where we actually have used ethnography for low-income consumers in Vietnam. So for this specific study, of course, we always have in our mind our internal customers, which are always marketers. Give me some insights so I can create specific concepts. So we don't bring only a flavor as such to our customers, but we also bring the flavor inside of a concept. Of course, our technical team is our second inter internal customer because they want to have new ideas as to what direction they could take for new prototypes as well. So for this specific study, we took 14 different kids from eight to 14 years old. As you know, before eight, the kids cannot really express themselves fully, so we decided that was our cutoff point. And we actually went to three very different studies in China. Different cultures, different exposure to international markets as well, that's why we selected these three different cities. And what we actually did is we first pre-prepared the kids by sending them a little notebook. So in the notebook, they could actually tell us about the activities they would do, could stick pictures, what they want to aspire to when they actually grow up. Then our team, of course, I didn't go because as you know, I can speak Chinese, don't look Chinese. So of course, the kids need to have, they're in their natural environment. Already you arrive with a big team, so of course I couldn't attend, but uh, I've seen uh, some of the videos. So we go to their house and then we have the kids to tell us about their little notebook. What have they uh, talked about in the notebook? And then we have a look at how they interact with their parents. We also have a look uh, for this specific category. We were interested in confectionery. 
So we actually went to check what type of confectionery they had in the, in the cupboard. We tried to understand how the mom buys confectionery and so on. Then we actually went shopping with the kids, not only for confectionery, but of course we always have to think about flavors on the top of our minds. And the kids actually could go to different uh, sections of the supermarket so we could understand what is important for them when they have their own money, what will be the purchasing process. Finally, what we were trying to understand is what is overall the world of kids and how could we use that to develop different concepts. So what we have discovered, as you know, in China, kids are put under a lot of pressure. So when it comes to food, the moms allow everything. Okay? They, they actually are the ones who do a shopping list for their moms when it comes to confectionery. The mom calls the kid. If the sweet is not there, the mom has to go to another shop. No choice. Okay? Then what we also uh, discovered is for our technical team to be able to focus on two specific categories, we discovered that bubble gums and lollipops are very important for this age category as well. Of course, in different cities, we discovered also different backgrounds. Shanghai, very exposed to international brands, very open to new concepts, very aware of premiumness as well. When you go to Chengdu, actually, the kids are much more relaxed. They're more laid back. But when we observed what they were eating, they're also exposed to spiciness. So you will see it, give, it gave us ideas to actually develop the right concepts. Then when we went to Guangzhou, the kids are super critical. They actually don't want to try anything. They don't like anything. Nothing is good and so on. But they're also exposed to different types of uh, beverages as well that can give us also ideas for different flavors. So when it came to us observing them in front of a shelf, what was very important for them uh, when they were purchasing something. You have to remember we did not give them money. They had to take their own money because if you give money to the kids, then they buy things they would never buy usually. If it's their own money, they think twice. Okay? Product attribute, the most important thing when they purchase, especially the flavor is number one. That means the flavor even comes before the funky, groovy packaging and game. Okay? So for us, it's key to have the right flavors on the market. Then the segment is very important. Am I going to go for a lollipop or for a bubble gum and so on? And then the appearance of the sweet is important when they can see the sweet because most of the time this packaging is actually opaque. Then the packaging comes on board with all the cartoons and all the games. The product brand, if you ask the mom, it's the first number one uh, when they actually select products for their kids because it's synonymous of safety, premiumness, high quality. The kids, they don't really pay attention to that. And of course, I don't know who has kids in the room, but the price is really not so important for them. When it came to getting ideas for our technical team, we actually tried to see what the kids had selected. And you can see here a few ideas. Of course, some of them are very obvious, such as fun shapes, colorful shapes. But the kids were often speaking about long-lastingness. So then we have solutions in our portfolio to create this long-lastingness. Then visual treats. If a sweet is actually plain, they like it. But if you have little bite, uh, maybe colorful little points or, or things like that inside of it, then it excites them a bit more. So all these ideas were put together with the technical team to actually create the right concepts later. Finally, what was the most interesting for us and to our marketers is to discover what are the different directions of kids' world. What do they like? And how could we actually translate these six different directions into prototypes? So I won't go in details uh, for these six, six directions, but literally the technical background and the marketing background we discovered, we put that together to create the right concepts. So it's just a snapshot on what we have created. In the ethnography process, we discovered that interaction with the food and surprise is very important. In the ethnography process, some of the kids are exposed to spiciness, others start liking mint. So what our marketers did is they put together a mood board and we also have designers to draw actually what the concept would look like. But then it doesn't stop here. We had to bring those concepts to focus groups after. It's just how do we, how do we use the insights to actually create the right concepts. Another example, were, so this one was about doing it yourself because the kids love doing that at their, this specific age. Even if I have the same thing as you, I want to make my own. So here we had red bits of chili. Of course, we don't tell them it's chili. 
then the blue beets are mint, so then they can select which, you know, do I go for fiery today, do I go for cooling today, so they could do, do it by themselves. Then the second exa example I have here is a lollipop we had. So usually lollipop is a very hard texture. It was actually a gummy bear texture. So the kids were very interested in that, even though it didn't last long enough. Because the beauty of a lollipop, it lasts forever. Gummy bear texture, after two minutes it was gone. So they didn't like the concept anymore at the end. Okay, so first example. Another example why we have used ethnography, low-income consumers are actually a segment in Asia which is growing. However, so far, they didn't have the monetary power to purchase things. Big cities are going to these low-income consumers, or low-income consumers are coming to these big cities. Suddenly, they have a bit more money to spend. However, at the moment, we don't know what they're going to like if they're exposed to choice. So that was very interesting for us to actually go to rural areas of Vietnam and do ethnography, especially for our technical team, because most of our technical team is located in Singapore. So all the insights outside of Singapore are always very interesting for them. So what we actually did is we were interested in culinary habits to know what are the key flavors they're always exposed to, and then shopping behavior as well. These are the six different cities we went to, and in each city we actually targeted four different families uh, who had kids or no kids, so we wanted to see both. And what we actually did is we observed them when they were cooking, we went shopping with them, we actually interacting, we interacted as well with uh, different uh, people on markets or in little shops. And for us what was very interesting is to really understand what they actually consume and how often they go to different, through different shopping channels. So wet markets, they go very often. Of course, they don't have the capability to refrigerate their food. So what they actually do is they go a few times a day. And in Vietnam, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have tasted Vietnam food, freshness is really key. So for us, when it comes to actually creating product, we need to make sure that all the fresh herbs they're exposed to is actually translated well in terms of flavors. Then the second type of shops that they go to is this little corner shop, but they tend to buy household there. Or if they're missing one ingredient to cook, emergency situation, they go there if the market is closed. Finally, supermarkets, it's really an entertainment for them. They would never buy in supermarkets. They see that as a very safe place to bring their family during the weekend but it's way too expensive for them to spend any money in there. So for us, the insight, what was the most interesting was to go to the market with them and really discover, discover what are the background flavors these consumers are exposed to. So whatever area we went to, we discovered that there are key signatures in the life of these consumers. I won't go through all the ingredients, but literally almost on a daily basis, they are used to cooking or they're exposed to this type of flavors. So how useful is it to us after that? If we get a brief for this type of consumers from our customers in Vietnam, we know straight away what type of flavor we need to include actually in our product to make it like a signature flavor. What we also discovered, of course, is there are different cooking techniques depending on the area where the consumers were located. In the south, consumers tend to use much more cooking techniques than in the north. Similarly, in the north, you have different seasons, especially cold season, so they're going to use deep fried cooking process. So the way we have used this information is we have created cooking process flavors as well. Okay, so you have a deep fried flavor, cooked wok flavor, stewed flavor, and so on. So that was very useful to, to our team. So what we have done after is the, the marketers for specific projects have tried to put things together. We have to consider we cannot go too far away from local flavors because these consumers are considered as survivor. They need to be to have very safe flavors, okay? So we cannot have a, an Indian curry type of noodle. They won't understand what it is. They'll be afraid of it. So what we actually have done, focusing on a category that these consumers can buy, is we have created a chicken for instant noodle whereby it's the flavors they're used to. And then to understand all the flavors that are in, we have like all these key flavors we observed when they were cooking. Another one that we have thought about is currently they actually mix all these fresh herbs and so on, but sometimes fresh herbs can actually deteriorate if they actually cannot keep them fresh. 
So it's to have an all-included type of fish sauce. Fish sauce is used as their salt, literally, where we can include already different flavors uh, that they would have. Okay. So uh, from a company perspective, actually, when we hire agency to do an ethnography, we have identified some benefits to ethnography, but also some limitations. Okay. So the benefits for us is really, uh, it, it, I think so far it's the most insightful we, we've gone, to be honest. We've used a lot of online surveys, focus groups, and so on. But to understand this type of consumers, which would not be very comfortable coming to a focus group or even going outside of their habitation, it's really very insightful for different reasons for us. We can touch on different topics at once. That means, you know, when we visit the house of consumers, we can see how they cook, we go shopping with them, we can see even how they eat, what's the structure of the family, and we can also target a few consumer types at the same time. When we visited the kids in their house, we also learned a lot about the moms and the grandparents if they were around as well, okay? So then the limitation, once again, as a company, okay, we see, is especially for me, I mean, I, I, I really understand the power of that, but then people who are behind numbers when we do budgets, they're like, how come you have 14 kids and it costs that much, okay? So until they actually see the final results for them, they think it's very expensive for the amount of consumers you actually get. Also, it takes some time. I mean, we cannot do that for every project we do. So we tend to do it proactively when we have a specific flavor uh, collection we want to put in place. Of course, you, have to, you need to have very well trained team because if you go to the house of somebody, you start sitting them asking questions, you've missed the mark, okay? So for us, it's always sometimes a challenge and I hope we, I can interact with a lot of people who are specialized in that here to find like good trained agencies to do ethnography. Uh, even if consumers are observed in their natural environment, our local team actually followed the agency and what they noticed is that it takes some time, actually, for consumers to get used to having people around and to start behaving nat naturally. But uh, for us, I mean, and that will be the end of my presentation, what we need to keep in mind is it, it's really only the beginning. I never had a final answer during an ethnography. I even had more questions after the ethnography than I had before. So, um, yeah, I hope, I mean, uh, I, I, it was an interesting view for you to, to really see how we actually use ethnography in the process of flavor development. I do have a question regards your clients. I, I, I suppose you are uh, delivering or producing flavors for the industry, for all kinds of brands. Mm -hmm. And how about if a brand um, has the idea of, uh, let's say, um, getting people in some whatever Asian region a new flavor which is might be popular in the Western uh, cultures you know uh, all I've seen uh, so far was that you anticipating what people do like in their in their specific uh, cultures in their specific communities how about if, if there is a brand uh, which is saying well I do have a very popular flavor uh, which works in what some 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 region and I would like to export this also to the Asian region so is, 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 uh, how, how do you work with the, with the ethnography in, in that regard? Okay, so uh, I would say for this type of project, which we had, uh, I wouldn't use ethnography, wouldn't use actually. It. Yeah, so as an example, we had this noodle producer. He had gone to the Philippines, and he was from Indonesia, and he tasted one of the top Philippine uh, noodle brands. And he told us, I want to actually uh, implement it in, Indo in uh, Indonesia. So the first step for us is always, before we even go to consumers, that's why we're, we're called the Sensory Consumer Insights Group, we would actually have our expert tasters to, to actually profile the different flavors that you can find in Philippines and in this specific one that he wanted to actually introduce to Indonesia. Then we showed him, okay, compared to the usual profile your Indonesian consumers are exposed to, it's very different. So at least he's aware, okay? Because sometimes it's just like, okay, I take a product here and I plug it there. No, it doesn't work like that. So what we did following that is we actually tested these specific uh, Filipino noodles with Indonesian consumers, 
having as well uh, all the Indonesian top performers in the same category. And what we actually noticed is the Indonesian consumers really liked this type of flavor, which was very, very different from what they, they were used to. But of course, you know, you cannot judge the success of a product on only one testing. So what we recommended is this customer to actually go for home use test or more of a long-term type of tasting. Because consumers sometimes they just get excited of tasting something new, but very often they go back to traditional. So we have to be very careful when, I mean, it, it happens very often. And to be honest, some of our customers are like vanilla flavor, put it globally still as simple as a vanilla flavor it cannot be global currently in ethnography when you are uh, telling the respondent that you are going to observe the behavior don't you think uh, a biasness might come that somebody is watching me and i may behave differently and how you uh, use that information or how do you remove that biasness yeah so i mean ethnography there, there's always the risk so i don't think currently like any technique is is actually perfect but for us compared to normal focus groups uh, already we see a huge difference uh, for us what we tend to do is to spend a, a full day with the consumers so of course there will always be a bias but they have been prepared that some people would come it's not like okay i don't know how many people are going to come i don't know how it's going to be we pre-prepared them somehow but there will always be a bias so the thing is uh, for us i mean we don't expect people to change their uh, shopping habits for us we don't expect them to actually cook differently for us so maybe on specific key uh, behavioral things which probably don't touch the food, they might behave differently, maybe interact with each other a bit differently. I don't know if sometimes they always fight, suddenly there is a team, okay, I'm nice to everybody. But when it comes to food, we feel that uh, consumers are true to themselves. They won't make this very unusual dish because we are around. <coughs> yeah. So to answer your question, I don't think there's any way to have people to behave uh, very naturally if, if foreigners are around, like people they don't know usually. Thank you so much for sharing this fascinating presentation, Michel. Um, and um, I also share the same experience in doing ethnography with kids and so forth and so forth. So, but I'm really interested to know your experience. Uh, just three questions, I mean three dimensions. For doing sensorial things between boys and girls, for kids, which one is more challenging, which one is more comfortable? Boys versus girls. Number two, between snacking based sensorial uh, uh, research and nutrition-based sensorial uh, research, which one is actually more comfortable and more challenging? And I think that's all. Boys versus girls, snacking okay. versus nutrition. Okay, so uh, actually, yeah, between uh, male and female, we always tend to think that females would be better at tasting. It is true after a certain age in life. But let's say for our expert tasters, the, the ones we actually recruit, we have more females who automatically are more interested in food, cook more often, so would have more vocabulary. So between little kids, there is no obvious difference between guys and girls. Uh, it's not like one would have more taste buds or more like better nose than, than the other one. And then the other one was research with kids, nutrition versus Snacking. Uh, actually, just to take the example of China, uh, you know, I, I think the moms start thinking twice because of the system where they put so much pressure on the kids for studying, they had allowed the kid to consume whatever they wanted in whatever quantity. And now China, for kids, is the second most obese country in the world. So following this specific study, we actually, um, talk to the moms and they started speaking a lot about obesity. So we asked the moms for this specific category, what would they like? So somehow, I must confess, we haven't done any nutritional oriented studies as such, because for us, you know, we speak about food, about the pleasure of eating food and so on. But I would expect it to be maybe a bit more challenging because when kids speak about what they like and especially confectionery, it's really an area that would even be more in I would say more exciting for them than, okay, how much vegetable do you eat and do you like this vegetable and so on, right? So I would say the non-nutritional one is always easier. 
I just wanted to understand if there are supplementary methods in addition to ethnography that you use normally. So I, I'm wondering if, if cultural insight is something that's of significance to this. So for example, understanding food trends and the significance of cooking in a certain way, et cetera. Is that a supplementary methodology that you might employ, like talking to experts or food bloggers, et cetera, or is ethnography sort of an end, end, an end unto itself? Uh, actually, we have, uh, we're doing a lot of global studies to understand the values of consumers. So I didn't really have time to present it here, but literally we have seven types of uh, consumers which have been categorized depending on the value they believe in. So the low, the low income consumers would be categorized for us as survivors. They're hardworking, they actually believe in, in family, they believe in value for money and so on. And this is a quantitative study that we have done. I think we had 40,000 consumers all over the world. So we also take that into account. Maybe not yet the cultural uh, cooking habits, if you want, but we also have on the background all the values that consumers believe in. It's very interesting to see the uh, herbs mapping, you know, in your chart uh, in Vietnam, South, Central, and yes. North. Uh, I just want to ask how big ethnography that did you do in different areas and how, what is the variation of the consumer, you know, that end up into that kind of mapping? Uh, so in each segment, we actually had, uh, uh, okay, we had six cities to eight, eight different families in each of the segments. Uh, what I'm not too sure is what are the differences between the consumers. So literally what we really try to understand, we don't go as far as comparing actually the four families to each other because for us the purpose is to try to understand what are the commonalities of this family. So of course, I mean, then depending everything that I portrayed here today, it's what is common. But there's a lot of other differences in terms of beliefs in terms of how the family is organized, whether you have kids, whether the grandparents are still at home. So we haven't gone as far as doing the difference between the families because for us, in terms of, of business goal, it's, it's not so important. But we have the data. <laughs> <laughs>